silver lining behind the uh, behind the clouds, so to say. But uh, a lot of time, a lot of times, I don't think suffering is is um, redemptive at all, uh, and that I think it can be rather cold-hearted to say that suffering is always redemptive. Uh, the the person who's uh, the, the middle-aged couple whose child gets killed in a car accident on the way to the prom, uh, there's nothing redemptive about that massive starvation in our world today there's nothing there's nothing redemptive about it so i think that uh that this can explain some kinds of suffering and and uh, it it can help make us hopeful when we ourselves are suffering that maybe something good will come out of it but in the end it really doesn't explain the the suffering in the world in my opinion and i want to point out something that you mentioned in your book which is that you understand um, how suffering can be redemptive. You had hepatitis as a child. You were you were sidelined from life for a while, and it led you to books, which led you to scholarship, which led you to your life. Yeah, well, that's it's absolutely true. I mean, I think all of us have had some kind of experience where suffering has has ended up uh, as something good. And in my case, when I was 16 years old, I was playing baseball and uh, in in Kansas, and I uh, in the middle of the season I got hepatitis, and uh, which effectively uh, ended my baseball career. But it turned out to be a good thing because uh, since I couldn't go outside or do anything, and since I was bored to tears watching TV, I decided to devote myself to the next year's. Uh, debate topic. I was a debater on the high school debate team, and I got really into that, and I started working harder and harder. And ever since then, as it turns out, I've been a bit of a workaholic when it comes to books and studying, so that if I had not gotten hepatitis, in fact, I never would have become a scholar, and my life would have been uh, been very, very different. And so I've always been extremely grateful that I got hepatitis because it's made me what I am. My guest is religion scholar Bart Ehrman, author of the new book, God's Problem. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. My guest is Bart Ehrman, author of the new book, God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. He's a distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Well, let's continue to look at what the Bible has to say about suffering, and let's get to the book of Job. I mean, the name Job is just about synonymous with, with suffering. Um, there's lots of different interpretations of the Job story, but you say, and I didn't know this, that the version of Job that we're familiar with is based on stories by two different authors, and that there are a lot of contradictions between what those two authors have to say. Yeah, that's exactly right. Most people reading Job don't realize that. And most people who read Job, I think, probably simply read the first two chapters and the last chapter because it's it's a very long book. And the the story of Job that people are familiar with are from the uh, the very beginning and very end. The story of Job as a patient sufferer uh, who is uh, rewarded for God for remaining faithful despite his suffering. Uh, what scholars have long recognized, though, is that the story that uh, is at the beginning and the end of the book book is quite different from the from what you find uh, in the middle of the book. Uh, the vast majority of the book, uh, from chapter 3 uh, all the way up to chapter 42, in fact, is not a story about Job. It's, it's a set of poems in which uh, Job and his three so-called friends have debates about why they're suffering in the world. Scholars have long recognized that these uh, these poems uh, with Job and his three friends come from a different author from uh, the the story at the beginning and the end. One reason f- for thinking that is that th- they're actually different genres. Uh, one is a, a narrative, a story; the other is poetry. But also, the portrayal of Job is very different depending on whether you're reading the story or reading the poems. In the story that everybody knows, Job is completely patient and refuses to curse God. In the poems, Job is anything but patient. He's impatient. He's demanding. He wants a confrontation with God. He, he insists on his innocence in the face of God, and he demands that God appear to him. Uh, at the end of these poems, God does appear to him and completely wows him into submission. Uh, this is a different Job from the very patient sufferer who is unwilling to say anything against God at the beginning and the end of the story. And I think that their views of suffering, in fact, are quite different from one another. What are the differences? In the story about Job, at the beginning and end of the book, um, God is um, is praising Job before the heavenly council. The, the The idea seems to be that God has a group of sort of demigods around him, one of whom is named Hasatan. Uh, it's translated as Satan, but this this Hasatan uh, isn't the devil of. Uh, 
later Jewish and Christian imagination. Uh, he's actually sort of the uh, the uh, adversary. The the name the word Hasatan in Hebrew literally means adversary, and so uh, I guess you could call him the devil's advocate. Uh, he's the one who says to God, "Well, yeah, Job is righteous, but it's just because you've given everything. Look, he's got all this cattle, and he's got this great family, and he's he's extremely wealthy. So of course he's righteous because he gets everything out of it." And God says, "No, no, no. He's not he's not righteous for that reason." he's righteous because he knows that it's right to be righteous. And Satan says, uh, in fact, take away everything and he'll curse you to your face. So God tells Satan to go ahead and do that, and Satan takes away everything from Job, destroys all of his cattle, uh, and has his servants taken away, kills his ten children, and Job still, uh, despite that, refuses to curse God. Job, uh, God then tells Satan that, see, he's still righteous, and the Satan says to God, well, it's because you haven't allowed me to hurt him, uh, cause some pain for him physically, and he'll curse you. So God tells him to do that, and Job comes down, uh, Satan comes down, and, uh, and inflicts Job with terrible boils all over his body. And so he's a bloody mess, and he's scraping his boils with a piece of pottery. His wife says, curse God and die, and, and, and Job says uh, that uh, if we receive good from God, we should also receive what is evil, and he refused to curse God for any wrongdoing. And then, uh, and then the, the, the poems intervene. And at the end, we're told that God is pleased with Job and uh, for the way he's acted. He gives him back twice as many cattle as he's had before and sheep and camels, and he increases his wealth even more. And he has 10 more children born to him, and he lives uh, to be an old man, ripe of, ripe of age, and, and he dies. So that's, that's the story of Job uh, in, the, in the beginning and the end. And the point, of, the point of suffering in this case is that suffering is a test from God to see whether you are righteous because you get something out of it or if you have a disinterested righteousness, that you're, you, uh, you're faithful to God no matter what happens to you. How does that compare with what the poems in between the beginning and end of the Job story have to say about suffering? Well, f- I think personally that the poems are far more interesting because Job is, uh, is more interesting. In the poems, the poems begin with Job cursing the day of his birth and wishing he had never been born. And his three friends who, uh, who have come to him turn out to be not very friendly. Uh, in turn, each one of them explains to Job that the reason he's suffering is because he's done something evil, and God is punishing him for it. So in other words, they have the classical view, the view of the prophets, that the reason they're suffering is because people do things wrong. But Job refuses to admit it. He says that he knows that he's blameless and upright, and he hasn't done anything to deserve this. And one after the other, the friends keep coming at him saying, no, he really deserves it. He needs to repent for his sins. And Job keeps saying that he's blameless before God. And at one point, finally, Job uh, demands God to appear to him so that he can uh, he can explain to God that he's blameless and take a stand on his own innocence and his own integrity. And then at the end of these poems, God actually does show up. But um, instead of explaining to Job why it is that this is happening to him, God instead uh, overwhelms Job and silences him with his almighty power. And he asks Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Uh, you know, who are you to accuse me of wrongdoing? You're a mere mortal, and I'm God Almighty. And in effect, what God does is he squishes Job with his thumb, since God is almighty and Job is just a peon. And Job then, despite the fact that he's blameless and innocent, repents in dust and ashes before the almighty power of God. So this is a, it's a very powerful and moving uh, set of poems, uh, the, these chapters in the middle uh, of Job. But uh, one comes away wondering, well, what, the, what then is the answer to suffering? It's not that it's a test, because the test is in the story part of Job, but not in the poems. Uh, and Job was innocent. And so he suffers anyway. And when he demands that God asks, when he asks God to explain himself why he's allowing him to suffer, God refuses to answer. Uh, and so the answer to Job seems to be that there is no answer and that you shouldn't even ask, that by asking God why this is happening to you, you're in fact infringing on God's uh, omnipotent rights. 